Hi, this is Park Madden with the Weather Store in Sandwich, Massachusetts. Today we're going to talk all about humidity and the types of hygrometers that I sell at the Weather Store. Uh, when I find people contacting me about humidity, they tend to be a little bit different than my average uh, customer who is looking for wind speed or temperature or rainfall. The person who's, and that's more about the weather, the person who's contacting me about humidity is more concerned with the air quality inside their house, and that's why I offer a nice selection of these instruments. People can have concerns whether they're health reasons or they're trying to preserve their collections or they just are maybe having an issue with too high of humidity or too low. And generally speaking, uh, uh, very low humidity, which tends to occur more in the winter. Um, for example, it's winter right now when I'm recording this. Um, tends to be, the air is very cold, and when it's cold air, it doesn't hold as much water vapor. So you find that the, um, the air tends to be much drier, and when you're then heating it up, you, you know, you're also robbing it of more humidity in that air. So uh, relative humidity inside conditions tend to be a lot drier. And for example, in the weather store here, I've got a heat pump which heats and cools the air, but it doesn't add any humidity to it. Sometimes people say that uh, radiators are actually um, a little bit, add a little bit more moisture, or don't take away as much moisture out of the air inside your house. But in my store here, it tends to be about 20 to 25 percent, and that is. Um, and today we're it's a little overcast, a little bit of rain. That's why it's maybe a little bit higher. But I've seen it go down into the into the teens a lot. Uh, certainly during the summer, because it's warmer, uh, air can hold more moisture at a higher temperature, it's more elastic, and that's why you see higher uh, humidity levels. So during the winter, people's concerns tend to be more about maybe the care of fine instruments like guitars or, um, or pianos. Uh, they can affect the tuning of that, especially if there's wood in it, because wood expands and contracts. It can affect the, the tuning of those instruments. Um, and then also maybe if you have health issues, asthma uh, can certainly be triggered by very dry air. Um, conversely, higher humidity can cause mold issues, mildew issues, and also can affect things like the, the swelling of doors and windows in their frames. Ideally, the range you're looking for is about 40 to 60 percent if you can get it within that number. Um, and that's why a lot of people uh, call me with questions about hygrometers. So let's dig in on the different types of hygrometers you like to see or choose from to suit your needs. The most common type of hygrometer, it's been around for a long time, is what I call a spring or a bimetallic coil hygrometer. You've probably seen these, they have nice dials on them. You know, the needle on this is very springy. I actually took this out of an instrument to better show you what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a spring or bimetallic coil. So I'm going to bring that as close as I can. And you should be able to see underneath there, there is a spring in there. It's basically a bimetallic coil that as the humidity changes, it either expands or contracts. And that is reflected on this needle here. You can see how it's springy. There are various uh, levels of quality. Some of the cheaper ones you might see are these little guys like this. You know, sometimes these are less than 20 or even $10. They don't tend to be terribly accurate. However, if you can find one that has a little, like this one, has a little slot on the back, you can put a little screwdriver in and you can make an adjustment to it if you find it's reading too high or too low. They should be ported, so there is an exchange of air to get through. Hopefully you can see that if I bring that closer. Spring thermometers, another example of a good quality one is this one here made by Maximum Weather Instruments. Now with this here, it shows humidity across the top and temperature across the bottom. It's ported on the back so it can get an air exchange. Um, and they calibrate and they test all these so you can be assured that it is accurate. The next most common type you're likely to find is a digital hygrometer. These are great. Uh, they have a nice large readout on it. So this one is reading 23% 23, 23 in here. Also, they're usually paired with a thermometer and often a clock. Nice thing about this one is that can, it'll tell you high and low readings. It has little magnets on it. You can just stick it right on your, right on your refrigerator, which is nice. Uh, they tend to be pretty affordable. Uh, but like all, 
all things, remember these are mass produced and they don't always have great quality control and you don't always have the ability to adjust them or calibrate them. So, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about calibration in a second. Uh, the third type, and you don't see too many of these much anymore, is called a hair hygrometer. And basically it uses a fiber, and again, I've opened up this instrument here. It actually looks like this when it's all together. Looks a lot like a dial hygrometer, but you're gonna see when I pull it out, it's a little bit different. You see on the bottom here, there is a fiber that wraps right around it. Okay, it starts there, goes around here, and then wraps around a little pin in the middle. And hair, human hair, and I'm sure a lot of people with longer hair would agree with me on this, that when it gets humid, their hair gets very curly and frizzy. And essentially what's happening is, is that that hair is contracting. And hair contracts on this, and when it does it, it actually changes the humidity. So I am simulating a contraction by simply pressing on it. I can even blow on it with my breath and the humidity from my breath will change it. You see, I probably changed it four or five. And then as it is exposed again to the drier air, it will begin to come back. So uh, that is a hair hygrometer. Uh, I do from time to time come across antique ones and even though I don't offer restoring a hair hygrometer as a service, it is a curiosity of mine and this here is from a beautiful hair hygrometer that I'm actually in the process of restoring. Really beautiful piece, brass, it's all ported on the side. This was made by a French firm called Nade, and also has a beautiful curved thermometer on it. Uh, but what I need from this is I need a proper hair on it and it's hard to see it on this one here but there is a hair and you can see the needle much like the other one that hair goes around a series of pulleys as it contracts with changing humidity if you see me pressing it like this you will see the needle moving and that's essentially how that works these are really neat when i can get these up and running but the trick is finding the right hair for them. Uh, this is another one that I have that is missing a hair, but I just wanted to show it to you. You know, these are nice little instruments. I've done nothing to this. It could use a polishing and everything, but inside it, it has a mechanism much like that. Uh, lastly, um, and this is a really cool instrument, and you might have to seek these out a little bit to find them, but they're called a psychrometer or a wet and dry bulb thermometer. And I've got one right here. And the way this works, this is, this is a neat thing. So we've got two th thermometers here, okay? And one of them is actually, has a bit of cloth wrapped around the bulb end, okay? And that cloth is in, in a little vat of water. And the water will come up this wick, so to speak. And people uh, studied this, and the people that studied evaporation realized that there's a correlation because there's cooling that happens whenever um, water or air uh, evaporates and it creates a certain temperature. And if it's very dry, it's gonna evaporate more than when uh, it's very humid. So what they did is they realized that there's a correlation between the two temperatures. So if you look on this, you're gonna see, and I hope you can see this, this is not the easiest thing to read, but these two thermometers are reading two different things, even though they are perfectly parallel with one another. So the one on the right is reading about uh, 22, about 22, 23 degrees uh, Celsius in this case. Doesn't matter if it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. The other one's reading about 14. And then, so what you do is you find the difference between those two temperatures. And let's see, 14 to 22, six, that's eight. So then there's a chart at the bottom, right? On this one here. And what you first do is you find the temperature of your air reading and again we were at about 22 i come across to 22 and then i come down i find the difference being an eight and i can read it i can't read it the eight is down here and we're showing a humidity in the you know mid 20s right now so a really nice hygrometer kind of old-fashioned you got to keep some water in here but that's how those work. Now, that one is, is designed more for 
hanging on the wall, a little bit more commonly found instrument. It's what's called a sling psychrometer. And basically the same idea. You've got the two thermometers on here, and then you wet this end, and then you spin it like this, okay? And that spinning uh, speeds up the cooling and evaporation process. You gotta be careful, you don't wanna clock anything, and especially careful if one of these that you find happens to contain mercury. So what you do is you do it and you spin it for a few minutes, and then again, using those same charts, you compare the wet to the dry, look up the chart and you find out. This is a great tool to have because it's spot on, on accuracy, it's, they're very accurate. And I really only use these if I'm trying to calibrate my instruments, if, if I'm concerned that they're not reading correctly. Now I'm not saying you have to have one of these, but it's a nice tool to have. Sling psychrometer, and it's spelled with a P. So <clears throat> that's gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about accuracy in hygrometers. Now, the best hygrometers I see out there are probably about plus or minus 2% relative humidity. That means if it is showing 50% uh, relative humidity, it could be as high as 52 or as low as 48. And it just happens to be uh, how accuracy is displayed. And you can't get quite the same accuracy out of a hygrometer that you can out of, say, a thermometer. And we're all accustomed to looking at a thermometer. If it says it's 50 degrees out, maybe plus or minus one inch. I'm sorry, one degree. And that, that, that's pretty good for most purposes. I also find, though, and that, so that plus or minus 2% is really what I'm talking about for a very good one. Most of the hygrometers I see out on the market, the quality ones, are probably more in the order of about four, maybe 5%, plus or minus. Uh, some of the cheaper ones I, I come across, uh, they might be as much as 10%. And those hygrometers are probably not tested in the factory before they're sent out. Um, and a problem that I'll get is that people will call me up and they'll say, I've got two or three hygrometers, and they're all reading something different. And they'll say that they put them all next to each other. And I've done this myself. I line them all up. And you might have one showing 48, another one showing 52, and I would say that's within accuracy. I would say that because of that plus or minus range. One could be reading two degrees too high, the other could be reading two uh, percentage points too low, and there you have it, covering that four percentage points span. And that's with a good hygrometer. So you can imagine the difference that you would get if we're talking about something that maybe only has an accuracy of, um, you know, eight or 10%. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out about um, reading humidity in a house is that it can vary greatly where you locate it. Now, humidity, relative humidity, important part, is based on temperature. It's the relative humidity for a specific temperature. So uh, if one side of the room is warmer than the other side of the room, but yet there's the same amount of vapor in the air, you're gonna get two different readings because it's a percentage. And like I said earlier, warmer air can hold more vapor than colder air can. So if it's cooler, your uh, relative humidity might actually go up a little because it's a percentage of uh, the amount that that particular air can hold at that given temperature. So those are a couple things to keep in mind, especially when you're setting up these hygrometers is placement, I'd say, place it in an area that is subject to kind of the average temperature. Now, a hygrometer can only tell you the air that it comes into contact with. So if it's in a box, it can only tell you the, the humidity inside the box. If it's right here, it's only telling you the humidity right here. And actually, it might be changing because we're underneath a light here. Maybe the breath is coming off. It's a lot hot here. Um, it might be changing alone. So those are a couple of considerations about hygrometers. Um, lastly, let's talk a little bit about durability and cost, et cetera, and overall performance. Um, your digital and spring thermometers are probably gonna be your more inexpensive ones. Anything like this that has a hair hygrometer, that 
because not a lot of people are making them anymore, and they're, they're maybe going to be older instruments. A lot more time goes into these. These are going to be more expensive if you can find them. They're probably going to be well over $100 even for a new one. Wet dry bulb psychrometers are going to be more expensive as well. Um, pros and cons. The digital hygrometers are great. They're very portable. However, the response time is not all that fast. So for example, if I were to blow on this, this only refreshes about every 30 seconds. Uh, some people might want a more instantaneous reading. So I find that digital hygrometers are great if you set them and leave them, maybe come back in a while, and it'll tell you what the humidity is. As I demonstrated with the, um, with the hair or spring or even the psychrometers, they're almost instant. I mean, you can get a, a pretty quick reading. And for people who want that, uh, pretty quick feedback, you know, that's important. You know, maybe if you're uh, trying to monitor the humidity in a bathroom, you might prefer something that's a little faster reacting. Um, however, the digital ones will eventually tell you what that is. Um, usage uh, would be another one in durability. Certainly anything with the hair um, or the digital pieces are really not recommended for outdoor use. And even though I do get some calls for people monitoring outdoor humidity, uh, the thing about outdoor humidity is we can't do anything about it, a lot like the temperature. So, and it can vary wildly because your temperature goes through big swings. Uh, in the morning when it's cooler, uh, you've probably all seen how there's uh, dew on the ground. Uh, you know, you can sometimes get to 100% relative humidity in the morning and then drying out a lot under the heat of the midday sun. So you can see a big range going back and forth throughout the day. And I think that's probably why people do more indoor ones. But with that said, because of that big range, that's why these spring or bimetallic coil hygrometers are going to be better for outdoor use. They're pretty durable. There's not a lot of moving parts on here. You know, this is going to be in a case with some access to air. Uh, but this is actually from an outdoor hygrometer. There are, if you search around, a couple companies that make instruments that measure electronically outdoor humidity. Uh, they tend to be more, more expensive instruments, as you can imagine, because that outdoor electronic component is going to need to be able to withstand those fluctuations. And sometimes they're probably not going to last as long as something like this will. And then, um, you know, again, ease of use. Um, you know, I think that obviously the uh, psychrometers, wet dry bulbs, are not the easiest thing to use, but they have very good accuracy. Uh, the hair hygrometers are great, they're very responsible, they have a very smooth movement on them, but they do require some periodic calibration. You might want to factor that in if you're considering one of those. Uh, and then again, lastly, you've got your spring and your digital ones. Um, obviously, digital is easy. You just look right at it. So is the spring. Um, the spring ones you can uh, calibrate occasionally, usually. Some digital ones you can. Uh, lesser price ones you can't calibrate. So uh, anyway, so uh, that is a lot of what I've dealt with with uh, these instruments over the years. Um, I really enjoy them. I think they're great. They serve a great need for people. People are very happy once they have these and they can monitor the humidity in their houses and better take care of um, the items. And my wife once said, if it can be measured, it can be managed. And if you can measure the humidity, you can better manage it. So I appreciate you know, you're taking the time to watch this video. It's kind of long, but we covered a lot of areas. I'll probably do some further uh, videos on this that maybe dive into maybe a little more specifics of some of these instruments, maybe about, more about humidity in general. But I really appreciate you taking the time to watch it. Again, if you like this video, please feel free to like or comment um, or c go to our website uh, for more information. Or even better, if you're in, uh, find yourself in Sandwich, stop in. I'd be happy to talk humidity and hygrometers anytime. Thanks again.